morning, everyone. Um, it's great to see everyone here. Uh, my name's Gary McLaughlin, and I'm actually a trade qualified French polisher. Um, I'd like to learn plastering one day, though. Um, I completed my trade back in 1988, and I was awarded the Leading Apprentice of the Year. I've worked, thank you, <laughs> I've worked across the whole sector from polishing office furniture on a production line um, through to my passion, which is traditional hand polishing. Um, I'm committed to passing on my knowledge and the skills in the trade as the owner of the traditional furniture restorer and we're located in East Queanbeyan. Over the last 17 years, I've trained five apprentices. I'm proud, to say our, I'm proud to say our business still currently still employs three of them. The others have gone on to open their own business or still work in the furniture sector. Um, we're currently looking for a young apprentice to take on, so if anyone knows someone that's artistic, willing to learn, I'm... We've got over 45 years, 50 years experience in our workshop to pass on. I'm pleased to have this opportunity to share my concerns for the persistent erosion of the traditional trades and the qualifications. And on our current path, we're, going to we're facing the foreseeable extinction of this knowledge, yet the trades still have a great relevance in modern society. I'd like to share my... Tonight I'd like to share my experience and talk about why this is and more importantly where the future opportunities lie. Before I continue, I'd just like to clear up one misperception in regards to the definition of my trade, which is French polishing is actually the process of finishing timber surfaces. It's not a material. The materials used in French polishing range from the traditional application of shellac to modern spray lacquer finishes, so we're trained in a broad area like locksmiths are. These skills have been developed over the last 250 years and, in my opinion, are in the danger of being lost in the near future. It's important to remember a trade isn't taught, but it's learnt. You start your apprenticeship at the bottom, you sweep floors, you make coffee, you assist your craftsmen, and over the four years you'll develop into a capable tradesman. You then spend the rest of your career honing your craft. So every day you learn. The day you stop learning is the day to walk away from it. You never know everything. I learned things from my first year. The aim is to master the entire trade, starting with the traditional skills that can be transposed to modern, modern finishing. To achieve this, you need good mentoring, support and training delivered by your tradesmen, a competent RTO, for example, TAFE New South Wales, and the support of the government. Um, I believe custom behaviour drives the entire furnishing supply chain. The current market trends for the flat pack assembly and cheaper imported furniture are putting a lot of pressure on the traditional manufacturers in our sector. In the last 10 years, and I think I meant to do this, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I've got to be carried away. Um, in the last 10 years, there's been a 12% decline in businesses in solid furniture manufacture over 17% decline in employment. And this directly affects apprenticeship numbers. Um, as an example, there's currently a total of 45 polishing apprentices in New South Wales and ACT. Compared to when I started, there were 200 first years alone. And it was an endangered trade in the early 80s. To survive, businesses, businesses focus on training for their own production and profit desires as opposed to the long-term skilling improvement and trade appreciation. It results in a narrowing of the workforce skills. The French Polishing School of TAFE New South Wales based in Sydney is under pressure from industry to soften the focus on traditional skills and to shorten the time taken in the delivery of the training courses. So this is a really good example in my trade. Over the last 10 years, the polycode industry um, supplying the gloss kitchen doors. Believe it or not, that is a form of French polishing. Okay, has seen, um, has seen this business become a major employer of apprentices. In turn, they're putting pressure on the TAFE system to remove the traditional skills from what they're teaching. Um, yeah, it's just going to be terrible. But 60% of the businesses in the furnishing industry are non-employing businesses, which means they're a single-person business. And it's not because of the lack of demand for the skilled craftsmen. They just don't employ and they don't put apprentices on. It's important to remember that trends change, and when this happens, the traditional skills required will be gone. <clears throat> when, I 
When the market trends shift or we face a period of economic downturn, businesses require a more productive workforce of a broader range of skills. Um, this change is happening now. Millennials there are a bunch of social conscious consumers with 75% willing to pay extra for sustainable products. And is the largest demographic in the workforce, their spending power is changing the trends in consumer behaviour. Young people are investing in items that will see the test of time. Customers are increasingly discerning as they gain more product knowledge, thanks to Google and the Facebook marketplace. We are seeing less brand loyalty to the big brands like IKEA and a move away from the mass production to individual design items. My business personally is seeing a massive growth in the upcycling of furniture. It's common to see a client's, clients source unwanted pieces from the tip or the roadside and invest in their revival. In response to this design trend, we're developing and perfecting our traditional finishes, such as the bleach shellacs and black shellacs, decorative finishing, and which are, these finishes are moving away from the traditional dark browns of yesteryear, so the dark old antiques. There's a growing market keen to invest in the conservation and restoration of their family pieces. There's a sentimental investment, which is maintaining a family history and preserves a sense of belonging. Another growth in this industry is the heritage building restoration and conservation, for example, government buildings and courthouses. This used to be the domain of painter and decorators. They've lost that skill. I talk to a 60-year, 70-year-old painter and decorator, he knows exactly what I do. A new painter knows how to use a spray gun. And there's limited skill, skilled tradesmen to perform this work. So, for an example, I spend a lot of time talking to TAFE in Sydney. But TAFE New South Wales has just developed and delivered a course for a Sydney-based heritage and conservation company. The business was unable to source suitably trained local employees and as such has brought 15 staff in on working visas. And the course was geared to them to conservation and the refinishing of timber in those heritage buildings using the traditional skills and the materials, teaching them how they work and how they could understand it. They actually offered the head of um, department a job and he said, I can't. He said, I need to stay at TAFE and train. He said, that's his place. <laughs> the preservation of attritional trade training with fully completed trades, not the softening, increases transferability and adaptability for both the industry and the individual. This enables knowledge transfer and success in planning. Trade skills encourage the development of creativity, problem solving and innovation in the workplace, which is now needed to meet the increasing and changing demand of the market. Um, this is an, an example. We had a client with a console radio cabinet, which was a family piece, deep sentimental attachment. The valve radio had been chucked out years ago. It had been in a garage covered in mouse poo, etc., etc. And they wanted to know if we could restore the cabinet and he thought if we could put a little shelf in the back he could store his liquor bottles and turn it around. He said, in that way we get to keep it. So Tara, who was my apprentice at the time, suggested, why don't we turn it into a cocktail cabinet with an opening top, a bottom door, the speaker will spin off, line it with mirror, LED lighting so it looks like a 50s, 60s cocktail bar. And we did it. Um, which Sorry. was great. So we re-engineered it, we did all the fit out. From the outside it just looked like a console radio from the 1920s but when you opened it, it was just magic and they absolutely loved it. So this is creativity and problem solving in action. Events like this and the trade show on the weekend, in my opinion, helped to build awareness of the traditional trades they're important in showing young people other career path options. These trades provide youth with the opportunity to express themselves, to be creative and use their hands. They allow you to challenge your mind and to keep on learning elements that are important for our youth. As I've mentioned, currently our apprenticeship system is being slowly softened by pressure. The other big contributing factor is the reduction in funding allocated to the SAFE system. What were previously three-year trade courses have been reduced to two years and in some trades to 18 months. This simply reduces the quality of the tradesmen coming out. 
you know, you all ask friends, like, if you know a good plumber and you can't find one, so what about trades like mine? And that's a licensed trade. Yeah, it's so important to keep investing in the training institution for better outcomes. You know, like polishing in Sydney is fighting for survival. You know, my, the head of school there will not let an apprentice finish in 18 months. They have to go for three years. In his opinion, you need the training delivered by them, the employer, their tradesman, and do it over a period of time to be a competent tradesman. Government incentives in sport and recognition of traditional trades is critically important. When I employed my first apprentice in the ACT, it took me eight months to even have my trade recognised in the ACT by the government. And it took even longer for the TAFE New South Wales to be approved as a training provider for my apprenticeship. Removing these types of barriers make a big difference for serving traditional skills and knowledge. I'd also like to point out I'm also now in New South Wales and New South Wales training you, is highly supportive of apprentices, which is really good to see with funding in regional areas and everything to help them out. I'd hope that one message you take away from this is the need to preserve the traditional trades. It's important for industry to maintain its flexibility, its adaptability and therefore profitability. The employees in turn have a more fulfilling career that allows them to develop their creativity, their problem, problem, their problem solving skills, which encourages innovation for the future. It allows society to preserve its heritage and focus on sustainability. As a craftsman, it's important to ensure the traditional skills are passed on for the future. But it is hard to find an apprentice with the right fit. It's expensive and at times frustrating passing on these skills. I've spoken with many tradesmen who say I've spent four years training my apprentice and then they just get up and leave. I'm not going to waste my time training anymore. But that's the wrong way to look at it. What it really means is you've invested four years of your time mentoring a young mind, ensuring your passion, knowledge and skills preserved for future generations. Just like your children, you watch them grow with your guidance and eventually they'll leave home. And you're proud of them, not bitter. It's an honour to see an old apprentice achieving their goals and pursuing their craft. As a craftsman, we need to remember that we don't train apprentices because we want to, we train because we have a moral obligation to society and to future generations to preserve these skills. Thank you.